Okay, so um, we're here for the um, two, five past two session. Um, what would Ember look like uh, as a, on the server? This is Richard. He works for the media suite in Christchurch, but not actually in Christchurch. And um, he's going to tell us now. Thanks. <laughs> Cool. Hey, guys. Uh, super excited to be here. Yep. As said, my name's Richie. Um, that's my Twitter handle there if you want to hit me on Twitter. Uh, I am a developer for MediaSuite, as said. Um, we are a pretty awesome company uh, based out of Christchurch. Um, we do a lot of really, really cool projects uh, on a full JavaScript stack. Um, on the front end, we use Ember on the server uh, node. Uh, the developers we have are working out of not just Christchurch, but other places in, around New Zealand and even uh, around the world, like me. I live in uh, Oslo, Norway. Uh, as an aside, someone said to me I should totally have an icebreaker of some kind, so uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it is kind of cold in Norway right now, but maybe not quite that cold. Um, so I work out of a, a little, uh, really cool little hacker space in downtown Oslo. Uh, which is awesome, and then work remotely for Christchurch or New Zealand. Also super into conferences. Um, one of the cool things about living in, in Europe is uh, being able to go to all kinds of different countries on the pretense of visiting, going to conferences and stuff like that. Uh, also uh, been organizing a few, um, like these ones. We've got uh, Web Rebels coming up in, in June in Oslo, which is going to be awesome. I was involved in a couple of node comps and even the node comp in Christchurch a couple years back, which with the rest of the Media Suite gang. Um, so talk title, yes, what would Ember do, WWED. This kind of came about from uh, about six months ago maybe and, and just ongoing discussions around uh, pain points with our um, back-end stack um, and sort of kind of got me thinking, man, what would it look like if, if Ember was actually like a server-side framework as well? Like how would, how would that look? Could, could we kind of... Um, could we code in something like Ember from, from the right from the back to, all the way to the front? That'd be pretty sweet. Um, so that got me uh, working on this project, um, which I've been kind of using all my spare time on for the last six months. The little um, li things here are like uh, leaves of an ash tree, so that's the, the logo there. Um, so what is ash? Uh, well, it's an API framework. Um, it's built on top of Express. Um, <laughs> Express uh, JS in the node space is quite a low-level uh, framework, but it's, um, it's excellent for building other frameworks on top of. There's a few other, others that have done that, and they even list on their website, um, look at all the great frameworks that are built on top of us. Um, so it allows you to kind of focus on building out a really nice like API uh, surface and not worry too much about the low-level HTTP stuff. Uh, there's a data layer which is focused on around Postgres. Um, there's no reason it couldn't support other databases, but that's kind of where I'm interested. Um, it's built on a module called Connects, and Connects is kind of to our data layer what Express is uh, to our HTTP layer. It's essentially things like connection pooling and a, a query builder and, uh, and even migrations and stuff like that, and then it makes a really nice level to start building out really good, uh, really good API services on top of in my mind. It's designed with Ember in mind. It's designed to be as good of a back-end for Ember as possible, uh, which means that it's uh, trying to be JSON API spec compliant. JSON API is uh, a way of, uh, is a specification for defi defining your, um, your uh, RESTful endpoints. And so uh, the nice thing about that is that if you, if you manage to build something on the server that, that supports JSON API, then Ember will just kind of talk to it, and you get that kind of functionality for free, which is pretty nice. And it is a CLI tool, so you can, um, you can generate the pro your projects. Uh, you can uh, scaffold out models and routes and uh, so on, and then you can run, run the server. Uh, it's built with modern JavaScript features in mind, so... Um, this means that we're using, for example, ES 2015 classes everywhere. And we have a small uh, Babel transpilation layer on top uh, that, that transpiles from uh, ES 2015 module um, syntax of like import and export and stuff like that into Node.js's require statements. 
Uh, some basic concepts. Here we've got uh, what the router looks like. Um, you see that the, we're importing the router out of Ash Core, and then we extend the router, and then we create this uh, map. We run this map function inside which we can define our routes. Uh, this one would be slash posts. This one would be slash post slash ID, and this nested route would be slash post slash ID slash comments. So the router transforms from the URL into and points uh, points the traffic at a certain route file, and then you end up with a route like this. Uh, which when we're handling our post slash post here. We've got we uh, import the, the route, extend it, and then all we have to do is implement a model hook. Anything we return from that model hook is going to get uh, output at the uh, at the API endpoint. Um, so in this case, we're just returning a bunch of data. We could also uh, use the data layer and uh, look up a collection of posts and return that. Find all returns a promise. The framework will unpack that promise for you, and, uh, and, and you don't have to worry about that. Uh, it can also handle streams. If you return a stream, it will unpack that for you. Uh, here's an example of using async await, where we're uh, first pulling the, uh, the collection of posts before filtering and returning that. So some other stuff. Uh, so routes and data layer are kind of the key uh, pieces here. But also, we support middleware, which is basically just a layer on top of Express's middleware. Uh, we have uh, services. The uh, data layer itself is implemented as a service. Um, we have mixins for sharing code between different classes. Uh, we have initializers, which is kind of an acknowledgement that when you're building on top of a framework like Express and providing a lot of high-level func functionality, uh, you're inevitably not going to be able to handle all the cases that people uh, will have, that developers will have. And so what you want to do is allow a nice, uh, clear, clean way for people to drop down to the lower stack. Uh, which in this case is Express. So define an initializer if you wish, and then you get uh, given the Express app in there, and you can do anything you can do with Express. This is uh, how you get started. Uh, there's a module called Ash CLI on NPM, and you just install that globally, uh, create a directory, and run Ash init inside there. And then you generate some uh, routes, models, etc., and then run the server, and then you should be up and running. And you end up with a, uh, by default, a server running up on port 3010. Looks something like that to start with, which I just did yesterday. <laughs> um, so I kind of want to back up a little bit and just talk uh, about framework design and framework, um, what a framework is and that kind of thing. So I mean, we all know what a framework is, right? And we know what a library is. But, but uh, how do you define the difference here? And that all comes down to this concept, which is inversion of control. So typically, uh, what you have is complete control of, your, of the flow of your application. Uh, for example, in this library instance here, we pull a get function out of Lodash, and then we call get and uh, proceed along those lines. We could pull in other libraries, we could pull out other functions, and we run them one by one or asynchronously or whatever. But we have full control over how things are executed uh, and the flow of things. As opposed to a framework, uh, this is Ash again. Uh, in this case, we're importing, um, importing the route, and then we're exporting something. And that's all we do. We never actually execute any of these things. We expect the framework to execute these things. And that, essentially, is what inversion of control is. Uh, you'll notice also this extends part here. This is a pretty, uh, another kind of concept in frameworks. Um, the idea is that the frameworks typically, in this case, it's kind of object-oriented. So it, it's extending, um, extending a, a class hierarchy, but it can be different forms. But the idea of, is extensibility, and that the framework will provide you with some kind of base uh, functionality that you, you then uh, extend. Another framework concept is this one. It's, kind of, uh, it's called sort of hotspots, where these are the hotspots that the, that the framework gives you in order to implement your business logic. Again, you don't get any control over when these are called, but that's where the framework expects you to, to, to do things. So um, how do frameworks define themselves is kind of like any framework with, a salt, uh, with its salt in my mind um, it is, is going to have some kind of like document or some kind of philosophy that, that uh, it wants to communicate to people using it that this is, this, is, this is our value proposition and this is how this is what we think we're giving you and, and the direction we're heading in. Rails famously has the Rails doctrine. Uh, which talks about things like convention over configuration, uh, which is the idea that the framework tries to offload uh, as much uh, manual, repetitive tasks into the framework, and that you should focus on your business logic. 
Uh, Django's design philosophy is pretty similar, except it has kind of a concept of explicit versus implicit, which is to say that please only use water magic as little as you possibly can and make things explicit, water magic being sort of a uh, black box framework. Um, what, what is the framework doing that you can't, you've got no oversight over? Um, so please, Django thinks, you know, please don't do too much of that. Or only do that where it makes sense. Ember has its own design uh, philosophies and stuff, um, but they tend to be a bit similar, but then also a bit focused on the client-side JavaScript space. Uh, and this, uh, this typically means things like dealing with hype fatigue, um, uh, the, the concept of stability without stagnation in the Ember space is all about trying to uh, do the heavy lifting of um, keeping an eye on the, the wider JavaScript space and uh, pulling in important and interesting developments from, thing, from other frameworks, from other you know, language concepts and things in, into the framework for you and integrate that. And so you should be able to just stick with Ember and just follow the release, the regular release cycle, which will always give you a clear upgrade path and um, allow you to get the best without um, and not get left behind, but also not have to spend a ton of time relearning uh, new stuff. So, um, I'll just take a quick pause. So most frameworks also fit in kind of a continuum in a number of different categories. Um, frameworks typically tend to be sort of either quite opinionated or quite unopinionated, which is kind of a weird concept because to be un you're like super opinionated about being unopinionated as well, so that it's kind of odd. But this essentially says like how much is the framework dictating uh, how you should do things versus how much the framework is trying to get out of your way and let you do what, whatever you want. It's kind of integrated versus distributed. This is just talking about um, microservices versus um, monoliths, pretty much, uh, and all the requisite debates about the pros and cons there. Minimal versus maximal, uh, how much of a toolbox does the framework typically give you? Is it sort of just enough to get your stuff done, or is it trying to give you everything under the sun? Productivity versus control, um, this is back to the convention of a configuration idea from Rails, where uh, you, in theory, give up some of your control in order to be as productive as possible, or vice versa. Explicit versus implicit, also, also discussed um, how much auto magic is going on. This is what Ash looks like. It's pretty opinionated, it's pretty integrated, maximal, uh, aimed at productivity, and pretty, pretty much uh, Im implicit, with a caveat in that I'm very aware and very keen to, to build it in such a way that um, where there is auto magic or kind of this implicit uh, behavior going on that is hopefully making you more productive and, and helping you to not have a lot of extra boilerplate code to maintain, uh, there are good fallbacks for, for um, dealing with complex situations that were not anticipated by the framework. I think this is a really important idea. So, it's kind of two sides to the design process. Um, I feel like uh, making anything like this or, or making software is often about solving problems, and I think solving problems kind of gives you a definition of done. Um, so having problems uh, from, from our previous experience and stuff gives us, um, gives us a direction to head in. Um, some of the problems that uh, we've sort of encountered in the node space typically tend to be a lack of good Ember support. Uh, this often means things like lack of support for JSON API um, and, uh, and many node-based back-end products are aimed at other frameworks like Angular or React or just no framework at all or much more sort of microservice oriented. Uh, incoherent APIs, both at the level of a framework itself being incoherent and not giving you really kind of consistent ways of sort of surprising APIs, uh, that kind of thing can be very frustrating. Uh, or even just at the level of uh, pulling in a lot of small node modules and working with those uh, inherently tends to produce um, less of a consistent API surface because different authors are making all these different things without thinking about the whole. Um, not enough productivity. Uh, there are, I think, really good reasons to want to start from a lower level and build up your stack completely, um, depending on your case. I think um, a lot of our experience uh, with the kind of work we do is that um, we, 
when we start a lot of greenfield projects, uh, we want to get productive out of the box as quickly as possible, and we don't want to sp spend a lot of time reinventing the wheel. So the other side of this is kind of coming back to the title of the talk um, and the idea of kind of copying Ember. Um, so if the, the having problems gives us a direction to head in, um, uh, copying Ember kind of gives us a, a starting point. Um, and so talking about the creative process and, and copying, well, copying isn't exactly copying, I don't think. Copying is kind of more like trying to copy uh, something. We maybe pick a feature out of, out of Ember and we're thinking about how would this work on the server, uh, routes or something like that. And so we try and, try and kind of copy this, but we inevitably fail because the server context and the uh, client context is not exactly the same. They're quite different. And, uh, and so then we kind of learn something and we, 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 we start to think about the differences and, and how this might work, and we kind of adapt to a solution, and then we end up with like hopefully good, a good design um, and hopefully consistent design. Here's a bit of a side-by-side -side comparison of Ember and Ash. What you see here is, um, is the router, and uh, you have to look a little bit closely to spot the differences. Um, the only difference here is that um, we are not using Ember's object model. We're using ES2016 class, 2015 classes. So um, class router extends ash router instead of router equals ember.router.extend. Uh, otherwise, the map function is the same and everything. So similar, in fact, that we were able to leverage some of the Ember modules to actually do uh, route insertion via the CLI. So if you go ash generate uh, route of some kind, it's able to insert a new route entry into this router map um, based on the work that's done, been done in Ember, and we just, just leverage that. Um, the data layer also looks really similar. Uh, the store, in both cases, is implemented as a service on a route, uh, and all of the methods, find all, query, etc., they're all pretty much named identically. Um, the differences come in where server and client are a little bit different in the sorts of options you might need to pass to some of these methods, and you're dealing with a database specifically versus Ember, which is dealing with um, uh, kind of doesn't care what the back end is and is pretty loose about specifying a lot of things like that. Um, sometimes we took a different direction. I mentioned the object model in the S2015 classes. It kind of felt like that um, it makes it, it's just a lot easier to use the, the new class syntax. Um, it does almost the same thing. And I'm pretty confident that if Ember was to rewrite themselves from like today, they would use classes anyway. Um, Control is another one. Uh, didn't bother to include these at all. Um, uh, Ember is kind of deprecating them anyway, and routes do about the same job. Uh, some things just don't make any sense. Um, when you're building an API framework, components, templates, and computer properties are not something which are all in Ember, not something that, that we needed at all. So, goodbye. Um, and then other things are, are basically pretty similar. Um, and the starting point was very similar, but the iteration process of kind of working through how these things looked um, was developed quite reasonably significant differences between the two. Um, in the Ember case, we have all these hooks that happen inside a route, and they happen in order. You've got before model, then model, then after model. We've got all of those, um, but we also added deserialize and serialize so that we could deserialize from uh, JSON API to uh, a sort of a standard object, and then vice versa serialize to JSON API at the other end. So we can hook in serializers and deserializers to do that work. Um, also notice the actions block uh, over here in the Ember side. They, uh, this doesn't make any sense on the API uh, back end. The actions block in Ember is used for handling uh, user in uh, interactivity via clicks and all that kind of stuff, which we don't have in an API. Um, some things uh, kind of go the other direction. So. Um, uh, for example, uh, verbs. Uh, when you're working with a single page app, uh, you're always dealing with get requests, at least in, insofar as the interactivity from the browser. You put in a URL and it routes to a route and it's always a get request. Um, however, when you're building an API, you need to be able to support delete and post and put and patch and all that kind of stuff. And that was kind of, this was kind of one of the big discussion points for a while was trying to figure out like how does what's the you know, how do we do this? How do we deal with this? kind of difference and, and stuff. What we ended up going with was a file name convention, uh, which looks like this. So if you do a, uh, if you, you po if your route is named the same as it would be in Ember with um, app routes posts.js, it's a get request. 
if you add .delete.js or .patch.js into the file name, into a second file, you can just drop in extra files to handle different verbs, uh, then it will be handled differently um, depending on the name of the verb. Middleware is not a concept in, on the client side at all. Uh, so we had to figure out, we had to answer that, that kind of question of, from the title, you know, what would Ember do here? What, what would Ember do if it had to support middleware? Uh, the solution we came up with kind of took some time to figure out and um, uh, hopefully is in the spirit of what we think Ember would, would do. Um, question, where are we at now? Could I actually use Ember now, uh, Ash now? Uh, no, I wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> It, it still needs quite a bit of work. Um, it's in sort of an alpha -y stage, um, but by all means, please do try it out. There is a module on NPM you can pull down and, and try. Uh, there should hopefully be, I think, enough instructions on there to get started, and there are reasonably good API docs um, which are pulled out of uh, the code comments throughout the code base and then get built into a documentation page every time I push to master, so that stuff is at least sort of up to date. Um, but, uh, but by all means, it, this is not production ready. Um, but feedback, yes, definitely. Uh, so what's next? Um, so kind of the next stage for me, at least at this point, is I really need to figure out if this is actually a sensible idea or this is just completely silly. Um, so I kind of want to put it out to the wider community, especially the Ember community, and see, kind of get a sense of what people think and whether they, uh, whether they are interested. Um, happy to keep working on it. It's super fun. I love it. But at the same time, if it's just totally dumb, then I'm just going to stop doing it. <laughs> um, and so assuming that people like it, then lots more test and stability are required. Um, there are parts of it that are like really well tested and other parts which are not tested at all, um, and just based on you, know, you get into a, a phase of prototyping things and trying to get things working and, and uh, deciding to come back to some of that later. Um, some of those fallback options I was talking about, especially in the ORM, need to happen. Uh, I really wish to be able, want to be able to um, have that high-level ORM and then fall back to some, some kind of like model hydration from SQL level and then like a full SQL level so that uh, you never get stuck by the, get trapped by the framework. Add-ons are something we'll end up modeling off Ember's add-ons. Um, documentation and guides are a huge pain point for anyone starting a new framework and I uh, really want to make sure that that is not not a problem. Um, I think it's really important for a framework to endorse like this, to really endorse a testing uh, story, have a good, um, clear uh, testing, testing uh, pattern, and support with whatever it needs to um, support those testing options so that people can, can, can easily and are encouraged to test uh, as much as possible. Um, I probably have two layers. There'll be like an integration layer, which is like all the way through, uh, and, um, and then like a... Um, a unit testing level. Security, I'd really like to spend some time understanding, uh, understanding the framework's security uh, from a security point of view and, and support good be security best practices and stuff. Um, better error messaging, this is something I started out with. I was like writing these really good error handling classes and stuff like that and, and the, that kind of just got left by the wayside as I like, started prototyping quickly. So I would like to go back and make sure that that's not a pain point, point for developers either. Um, and then, assuming people are interested, of course, then community, I, I, I would want to try and get other people involved at some point once I'm done uh, moving fast and breaking stuff. Um, that would be really great. And, uh, and I think it's really important to try and build up real world use cases while you're, um, while you're working on something like this and not build it in a vacuum. I think it's important to have a good sense of these are the pain points because I'm actually building something with this and, uh, and then I can do something about those things. Was it also had some vague discussions and ideas around, you know, if the syntax of like both in the server and the client is so similar, maybe there's some way we could get some crossover. I don't really know how this would look, but, um, but maybe in somewhere to explore. So um, please do try it out if you think this would be of interest. Give me some feedback, that would be awesome. Tell me what you think. Um, and thanks. Thanks, Richard. Hello. Thanks, Richard. Uh, any questions? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, thanks, Richie. Um, 
It's really good to see this first time I've seen it. Uh, you kind of touched on thinking ahead in the design versus prototyping and like just trying out a bunch of new stuff. What's the balance been like between those two? Um, so one of our colleagues and I, Patrick, have been kind of revving round and round on any particular subject before we do too much coding or I do too much coding. It's kind of been a design from the point of how would this work, how would this look, does this make sense, um, you know, and, and kind of iterating on that and then and then prototyping something and then being coming back to discussion and being like, uh, yeah, this doesn't actually work. I didn't think of this or I didn't think of that or whatever. And then going back and designing again and um, eventually kind of settling on something, sometimes settling on something and then coming back to it again later and going, yeah, that was silly. <laughs> Hi, I'm not sure if you heard um, Michael's talk from yesterday about reactive query. I'm just wondering if you um, be able to um, integrate Ash into Amber such that um, there's, there's actually no REST layer in between, just a direct connection between Amber and REST and, and Ash. I don't know anything about that as such, except that could it be compared with something like GraphQL? Yeah? OK. So in that case, uh, yes, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do like I thought about GraphQL and I started doing an implementation on on Ash just to try it out. Um, it's kind of flexible enough that you should be able to do something like that. We we don't have any obviously direct support for that at this stage, but it would be easy enough to do. So from as far as I can see, you're trying to support JSON API. So it should work with any other framework out there. Are there any synergies in using Ash and Ember? Or is it just generic framework for the API backend? Yeah, I guess that last point I touched on is kind of the, the, the last piece I have on that subject is kind of thinking how could could there be more than just a back end and a front end and some kind of synergy, as you say? Uh, at this stage, it's basically an API back end. There's no reason why it has to be for Ember, honestly. Uh, it's just that that's where I'm focusing my design attention. Um, I think it could be quite a compelling back end, in, uh, API back end in general, but um, that's not where I'm focusing my efforts. Yep. Okay, I think we probably better finish now. Thanks again to Richard.